Thank you, Rana, and it's uh, exciting to be able to uh, go through this uh, guidelines uh, review with you, and uh, uh, welcome to it, and we're excited to just go through with you some of the aspects of this um, document in terms of what's in it. Uh, I'm going to just first give you my disclosures, uh, the research grant support I have from industry, and then the learning objectives of this uh, webinar, uh, which will basically we'll go through some of the uh, highlights of the guidelines uh, paper uh, and some examples that hopefully emphasize how much uh, we think CONFEST can help you in your laboratory uh, just for the routine things you do every day, like regional wall motion analysis and getting better Doppler signals. Uh, we also want to make sure that we kind of go through a little bit of the ultrasound instrumentation uh, for injection of the contrast agents, um, a little bit of microbubble physics, not too much, but a little bit, uh, and uh, then the indications for contrast use and the appropriate justification for uh, that we believe uh, exists for sonographer-initiated intravenous access uh, for contrast administration uh, and uh, administration and uh, also starting the IV, uh, and then some policies that we think should be in place for uh, contrast infusion uh, uh, based on revised FDA guidelines. And finally, just to discuss, we'll discuss some new initiatives uh, for contrast uh, uh, as it becomes uh, uh, more and more uh, a part of our routine uh, uh, use in the echocardiography laboratory. First of all, I want to uh, acknowledge all the members of the writing committee. Uh, this was a combined effort of hard work. Uh, uh, Dr. Mulvey, as you know, uh, was the uh, writer, uh, first author of the 2008 consensus statement. Uh, Dr. Abdelman, I'm also at Mayo Clinic, uh, helped out uh, significantly with this document. Um, Kevin Way um, at uh, uh, Oregon um, and Todd Belchek, um, uh, also uh, very helpful in getting a lot of these uh, images uh, and in the writing of the document. Uh, Charlene Porcelli uh, from South Carolina uh, and uh, uh, Marty McCulloch uh, from uh, Texas, who at the time the document uh, was with Baylor. Uh, and Joan Olson, who works with us uh, here, um, our lead sonographer uh, at University of Nebraska uh, Medical Center, uh, and Dr. Gianni Susui uh, from San Paolo uh, also contributed significantly in providing a lot of input on the writing of the document and, and the uh, uh, images that you see in the movies um, as you go through this document on the American Society of Echo website. Again, I want to thank all of them uh, very much uh, for their dedicated effort uh, here uh, in writing this uh, guidelines paper. Uh, just a few uh, comments about the physics and instrumentation. Um, there are some um, very nice figures uh, which detail uh, some of the newer aspects of uh, very low uh, mechanical index nonlinear activity. Um, one of the things we emphasize, though, as you're a lab just beginning to use contrast, uh, that you learn just how to use it with the low MI, low mechanical index um, harmonic imaging, which we uh, have defined in the document as less than 0.3 mechanical index. Uh, and uh, the tables in the uh, document uh, go through with some optimization features, uh, table two, uh, you know, both artifacts and optimization uh, for both the low mechanical index harmonic imaging, which is universal. All the systems have that. Uh, and then the very low mechanical index nonlinear activity, which we would all, like you all eventually to be using, uh, and which is now available on all the systems uh, at a less than a mechanical index of less than 0.2, but gives you even enhanced uh, contrast activity, more bang for your buck, if you will, uh, in terms of what you get with uh, all the commercially available agents. And the reason that is is because we know at a very low mechanical index, and we're talking about 0.1 to 0.15, uh, the microbubbles uh, that are available to us today uh, already ex exhibit uh, what we call nonlinear behavior. Uh, and that's because they have this high molecular weight gas uh, inside of them um, that uh, doesn't compress as well as it um, uh, very well. And so when, it, when it's hit by ultrasound, even at these very low mechanical indexes, it decreases in size a little bit, but expands uh, to a much greater degree. Uh, and that's because obviously their density changes as you compress them. Uh, and what happens is you get what we call nonlinear activity, um, some of that being exhibited here where you see these different harmonic frequencies uh, the bubbles will uh, uh, elicit when hit with this very low mechanical index 
Well, tissue um, uh, tends to uh, have very little nonlinear activity uh, at these mechanical indices. So these very low mechanical index packages that are available to you uh, take advantage of that um, in that they capture this uh, nonlinear fundamental and harmonic uh, activity from the microbubbles. And um, while there's very little activity from the tissue, uh, they've developed some very uh, unique uh, methods of canceling that tissue activity. Uh, the very first of these was pulse inversion technology, um, which had a, a, a sent in uh, pulses of alternating phase at a very low mechanical index, less than 0.2. Uh, and uh, since they were alternating phase, if you just responded uh, linearly to these uh, pulses, you'd cancel uh, this combined pulse technique because this is the negative where this is positive. So anything that responds linearly uh, cancels while... Uh, Microbubbles, which already have a, the low mechanical index, respond nonlinearly, non uh, exhibit uh, uh, this type of activity you can see here that I'm with my pointer uh, that results in uh, activity when these two pulses come back to the transdu transducer. So nothing from tissue, uh, lots of activity from the microbubbles. So you have this uh, beautiful combination of tissue cancellation uh, and enhanced uh, uh, response from the microbubbles. Uh, other um, industries um, have come up with other techniques uh, to take advantage of this nonlinear activity. This is another kind of interesting one called power modulation, uh, where instead of a, uh, just alternating phases here, you send in the same pulse alternating amplitudes. Uh, these very low amplitudes um, uh, cause just a, a linear activity, uh, but when you go up to a little bit higher amplitude, let's say 0.16 instead of 0.08, you get nonlinear activity from microbubbles. So uh, that you send two little pulses, one a big pulse that's twice the size of the little pulse. If you just respond linearly, it all cancels out like tissue would, uh, while the microbubbles have, uh, because of this little bit higher impulse here, some nonlinear activity uh, that can be picked up by the transducer. And so that's another novel way. It's called amplitude modulation uh, of eliciting this nonlinear activity from the microbubbles uh, and can, uh, simultaneously canceling any uh, tissue signal. Uh, and this is the third one uh, that we outlined in the guidelines paper, contrast pulse sequencing, where both alternating phase and amplitude uh, are introduced into the uh, patient uh, with an ultrasound, a uh, very low mechanical index scheme. Uh, and this seems to bring out even more uh, decibel activity from the microbubbles while still being uh, cancelable by the tissue uh, and you get very exquisite images like this, where, where there's bolus injection or a slow bolus injection or infusion of contrast. Uh, as it just appears here in the right ventricle, you can see that there, the, with this contrast pulse sequencing technique here, uh, there's nothing coming from the tissue. You don't even see this. You can just make, barely make out uh, that this is a four-chamber view. Uh, then the contrast arrives in the left ventricle here. Uh, and you can see very nice uh, contrast activity. Again, very little activity from the microbubble. And because these are very low mechanical index uh, techniques that don't destroy the microbubbles, we see very nice myocardial contrast enhancement in the next phase of this uh, bolus injection uh, that, uh, again, without any tissue signal. So the degree of enhancement here uh, reflects uh, uh, the myocardial blood volume. And, and so you see the whole gamut of what these very low mechanical index imaging techniques can do for you in your laboratory day in and day out. We do this about 20 to 25 times a day in our laboratory right now where we give this uh, infusion of, of contrast either for a, a difficult study on the floor or during stress echocardiography uh, and get the advantage of very exquisite regional wall motion abnormality uh, analysis uh, and also look at perfusion, uh, though the approved indication, as you know, is just to enhance regional wall motion um, and uh, be able to delineate areas that you can't see well without contrast. And as you're aware, in 2012, the Inter-Society um, uh, Accreditation Committee uh, mandated that all systems, uh, ultrasound systems, have instrument settings that enable the optimization of ultrasound contrast agents, just like I, uh, using the techniques I just described to you. Uh, and that can include the low uh, mechanical index harmonic imaging, uh, but uh, we think you're going to get a lot more uh, if you learn how to use the very low mechanical index imaging techniques I just described to you uh, to get exquisite visualization uh, of regional wall motion uh, for the many times we need that during the day. 
Uh, and uh, the mandate also uh, stated that we need to use ultrasound contrast agents for all suboptimal images. And this was defined very nicely in the 2008 a consensus statement that if you have two contiguous segments that you can't visualize, uh, that uh, constitutes suboptimal images. Uh, but if you're doing a study for regional wall motion or for a quantitative measurement of ejection fraction, uh, then probably you need to visualize all the segments. So uh, it's not that you just have to constrain yourself to this two contiguous segments uh, model. If you can't see one segment and you're needing to do a quantitative ejection fraction, then maybe you should consider uh, contrast in that setting as well, depending on what the indication is. As you're aware, one of the biggest roadblocks to contrast uh, uh, use uh, since uh, its inception has been intravenous access. Um, and the American Society of Echocardiography has strongly uh, supported uh, training uh, sonographers in this area so that they don't have to uh, spend their time doing a study trying to go find a nurse or find someone who can start an IV and give contrast. Um, and the 2001 document, and we reinforced, uh, reinforced it again and now in the 2014 document, that uh, IV training and contrast administration uh, should be done by sonographers, um, and uh, we want to support you uh, uh, out there that are listening to, uh, to if you're having trouble with that, um, if you go to the appendix of the guidelines paper, uh, you see some very uh, uh, detailed um, uh, instructions on how the process of ordering uh, and personnel are done at the different hospitals that were involved uh, in, in the writing of the document. Um, Marty McCulloch has been a, a real champion in, in getting this uh, working in Houston. And... Uh, again, as you can see in that document, she's worked it out through her hospital administration that, that a sonographer or an RN uh, or a nurse practitioner or a fellow or attending can all be involved with this IV starting process, as well as within contrast, with contrast administration. Uh, and again, like I said, I think it's really working with your hospital administration to streamline this uh, so that the patient gets quick and effective uh, diagnoses uh, and a sonographer can be very much involved with that. Uh, at University of Oregon, if you look at the appendix, uh, they also have their uh, protocol uh, for best practices of contrast administration. Uh, and again, you see right up front there, when it's an IV that needs to be started, the sonographer is right up there at the front. Uh, and again, we thank Todd and Kevin for really making this happen there and, and giving us some examples of how that can work. Similarly, for contrast administration, the sonographer can give a contrast uh, while another one's imaging. Uh, or I think in some circumstances they just uh, will, if they can try to maintain an infusion uh, with a, some type of syringe pump device, just one sonographer probably is all that's needed for the whole study. So during this uh, webinar, we want to try to keep you stimulated. We know you're probably eating lunch or something, um, and we don't want you to fall asleep. So we're going to have a few questions uh, here uh, to kind of see how well you're paying attention and, and keep you involved. Uh, first one here. Uh, very low MI pulse sequence, MI being my, uh, mechanical index here, uh, very low mechanical index pulse sequence schemes. A, should be used for perfusion imaging only. B, can be used to detect subtle wall motion abnormalities. C, should be used for tissue harmonic imaging only. I should put that on there. D, uh, are available for three-dimensional transesophageal imaging, or E, all of the above. We give you about 30 seconds to answer that question. Okay, well, we're not off to too good of a starter today. Um, uh, really, the, the very low mechanical and pulse sequence schemes that we just talked to you about are primarily um, 
useful um, for both perfusion imaging, uh, but that's not the only thing they're useful for. They're also very useful for detecting subtle wall motion abnormalities. Uh, and I'll show you examples of that. Um, uh, tissue harmonic imaging is a term that's uh, been used for just uh, low mechanical index imaging, like less than 0.3 harmonic imaging, uh, and is distinct from these very low uh, mechanical index pulse sequence schemes. Uh, none of these, unfortunately, are available yet on uh, three-dimensional transesophageal imaging. Uh, we really do need them for that. Uh, but currently, uh, the correct answer is can be used to detect subtle wall motion abnormalities. Now, one of the things we talked about uh, just prior to this question was um, uh, overcoming the obstacles to getting a contrast started. Um, uh, equally important is recognizing when we should be giving contrast, as we, we told you about the IAC mandate. Uh, and if you fail to visualize two contiguous uh, segments, we recommend that you uh, start out using the low mechanical index harmonic schemes that are available in all systems, just turning your mechanical index down to less than 0.3, uh, and then slightly uh, turning your uh, time gain compensations up a little bit in the near field, uh, and getting homogeneous opacification from either a slow bolus injection or uh, a continuous infusion. And there are... Uh, uh, situations where we feel it's critical, the guidelines committee thought it was critical that you should see all segments. Um, clearly, that would be during stress echocardiography, where you're trying to diagnose um, uh, uh, ischemia, and you really need excellent regional wall motion uh, visualization. Uh, in the emergency room or critical care setting, uh, it's critical that we, again, see regional wall motion to rule out an acute coronary syndrome. Um, and in the critical care setting, to get a, a true assessment of ejection fraction uh, and regional wall motion. Uh, in chemotherapy patients, uh, where a small change in injection fraction is important, uh, again, contrast echocardiography in multi-center studies has been shown to be very helpful in detecting small changes uh, and having the um, uh, reproducibility uh, of a magnetic resonance image. And in cases where the apex is difficult to visualize, uh, there are several cases we outlined in the guidelines document, uh, including apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or taco tubo or non-compaction, where contrast is very helpful uh, in making that diagnosis. Now, on your screen right now, I'm going to show you a couple of examples um, uh, where low MI and very low MI uh, imaging has been very helpful just in uh, the setting of stress echo or chest pain evaluation. This was a 73-year-old um, uh, female, excuse me, male with end-stage renal disease um, that had uh, hypertension and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that was referred for stress echocardiography. Uh, these are the non-contrast images uh, here. And again, if the image quality does not look that bad, uh, but the sonographer felt the apex wasn't adequately visualized or maybe a little foreshortened, and maybe the lateral wall was not very well visualized. Uh, and I've left that apical four-chamber view uh, on the left. There does appear to be some uh, mild distal uh, septal hypokinesis, uh, but when we went to less than 0.3, about 0.27 mechanical index uh, in a harmonic mode, um, you can see uh, that uh, with slight increase in the time gain compensation in the near field, uh, we got very nice uh, cavity opacification, uh, uh, that you can see with low MI uh, harmonic imaging, and you can see very nicely uh, the apical wall motion abnormality that was not so evident on the non-contrast image delineated there. This is that three-chamber view in that same patient. This is the resting study before the stress echocardiography. And again, where the apex isn't very well visualized here, though maybe you think it is seen fairly well, you can see how uh, significant this wall thickening abnormality was uh, when you got good full opacification um, here with low mechanical index harmonic imaging. And these uh, arrows depict those uh, locations of uh, the defect uh, that we saw in the apical uh, uh, four and three chamber views here. Again, and this is a, a, a very good way to start if you're not using contrast yet at this point, is just use the, the less than 0.3 mechanical index harmonic mode that you're usually using just for imaging at a higher mechanical index, uh, and then use uh, just your time gain compensation or your TGC settings uh, to uh, optimize that near field gain 
uh, and follow some of the, the, the instructions there on Table 2 of the document and, and as well as on Contrast Zone on the American Society of Echo website that will optimize this for you, and you'll begin to see right away how Contrast can give you some very detailed uh, visualization of regional wall motion. Now, as I said, we would like you, as you learn more about Contrast, to begin eventually using the very low real-time sequences just to improve your detection of regional wall motion analysis. And I'll show you a couple examples of that as well. Uh, this is a patient, uh, again, that was being uh, evaluated uh, post-myocardial infarction uh, to get a, an ejection fraction. Uh, and this was the non-contrast image here. Pretty reasonable images, but they said they wanted a, uh, an exact ejection fraction. They were concerned about uh, in, uh, whether they needed a defibrillator. Uh, as you know, that's very ejection fraction based. Uh, and so um, uh, I wanted to show you just again uh, to outline a couple things you don't really want to do with the, just when you're using low mechanical uh, index imaging, which is here. And then this is the a very low mechanical index imaging uh, technique here. So this is just uh, two button pushes here uh, and a, a contrast, a low uh, bolus of contrast here. Uh, and you can see here uh, when they did the low mechanical index harmonic mode, the mechanical index was still 0.5. So there's a lot of contrast destruction there, uh, and so you're not really getting the uh, real optimization of the contrast here. You would really want to turn this down to uh, less than 0.3 in order to prevent some destruction in the near field. Uh, they had already turned the focus, you can see, up to the near field to try to uh, get a, a slightly better uh, delineation of the contrast. But even with that, you've got to have that mechanical index down a little bit more in order to uh, reduce the contrast destruction. or uh, if you have this available, and as I said, all system, systems really do, or manufacturers at least have this available, you can go to the very low mechanical index pulse sequence scheme, uh, in this case, uh, the amplitude modulation mode or power modulation, and you can see how much better the apex fills out here uh, at a mechanical index of 0.1, uh, and uh, you incidentally pick up the apical thrombus. Uh, that was also present in this patient uh, following uh, myocardial infarction here. Again, demonstrating that you can get much more from the same amount of contrast if you learn this uh, very low uh, mechanical index scheme just to improve your regional wall motion analysis. Now, movie 11 is a very good example um, uh, on the uh, uh, website uh, from this document. If you go to the website, uh, you can click on that. I'll show you an excerpt from that. This was a patient... Uh, a 54-year-old woman with nausea uh, that was, uh, uh, again, uh, associated with some shortness of breath, uh, a non-diagnostic EKG uh, in the emergency room, but there was some kind of uh, you know, less than 0.1 millivolt ST changes, and they wanted an echo uh, to assess for uh, a resting regional wall motion abnormality. The initial troponin was normal. Uh, and uh, the sonographer um, did uh, everything they could to get a good look at the regional wall motion analysis um, uh, here uh, using an even B-mode uh, harmonic color here, uh, and uh, they felt that everything was moving fairly well, but the uh, physician was still concerned and wanted contrast to still better delineate uh, these areas that um, uh, maybe weren't totally seen. They'll look, you could, I was certainly looking like a, you know, if you look at it, usually here, you probably say that looked pretty normal. But uh, lo and behold, when we gave, uh, in this case, a, a, a contrast infusion here, you can see there was a discrete infralateral wall motion abnormality right here. You can see that here is that very low mechanical index pulse sequence scheme. A high mechanical index impulse flash was given uh, to kind of clear the myocardial contrast uh, so that uh, during that replenishment phase, you could see this area right here in the mid infralateral segment that wasn't moving very well, uh, clearly not evident on the non-contrast image. Uh, this patient had a 100% circumflex occlusion, uh, and uh, their next troponin bumped to 10. Okay, so but they had to wait four hours for that uh, because this diagnosis was made right at the bedside. Uh, the patient went uh, to uh, an intervention much sooner than when the troponin came back around nine or 10 o'clock that night. Uh, because the contrast delineated this regional wall motion abnormality uh, in uh, a patient with the typical atypical symptoms that we tend to see uh, sometimes in women. Uh, uh, this is where it very much uh, helped uh, in detecting uh, this acute coronary syndrome uh, 
that actually was uh, a non-ST segment uh, elevation myocardial infarction. Here's another example of a patient um, that arrived to the emergency room uh, after uh, a VT arrest, uh, was shocked, um, uh, and uh, they uh, wanted a quick echo to see that EKG uh, did not show any ST changes post-cardioversion, uh, um, uh, but um, there was some a voltage criteria for LVH, so they still wanted an echo to rule out any regional wall motion abnormality. These are the resting apical two and three chambers here. Again, contrast was given right away um, uh, because once they got these, they could see they weren't seeing the, uh, all the region uh, re segments very well uh, and wanted a quick uh, assessment of regional wall motion. Well, contrast can be given real uh, quickly at the bedside. As I said, there's uh, in the appendix, there's several ways to do this. You can dilute uh, DFINITY in 10 cc's like the Mayo Clinic does and, and give uh, that as a 0.5 cc's after you've diluted it uh, uh, half a vial in 10 cc's and give uh, 0.5 of that with a 3 to 5 milliliter saline flush over 10 minutes. Or you can just infuse it uh, like some laboratories do. But in this case, this was a, uh, a contrast infusion uh, and uh, a, the definite basal to bit inferior wall motion abnormality was detected, uh, and the patient did have an acute uh, right coronary occlusion. This is the three-chamber view in that patient, not as impressive as the two-chamber view, but again, contrast quickly at the bedside made a diagnosis uh, that uh, really uh, got this patient where they needed to be. Let's go to our second question here. Um, this is a, a contrast injection. Uh, this is a bol bolus injection, just like I described to you previously, where uh, slow uh, uh, inject, uh, flush was given. Uh, so you're seeing the first part of the contrast appearance here. This is a patient that was uh, referred for a stress echo, had a previous interceptal and apical myocardial infarction, uh, and uh, they were looking for ischemia outside that territory. Uh, but as the contrast first appeared in the left ventricle here, uh, and then later, uh, about two seconds later, uh, you see contrast here, uh, and then eventually uh, you see uh, this uh, full uh, pacification uh, image here, again with a very low mechanical index uh, pulse sequence scheme. Uh, here's the way it was given. Uh, here's the, the sequence of time uh, of appearance of contrast in the left ventricle. Um, uh, I would like you to tell me what you think this contrast appearance uh, delineates. I'll go, I think it's on the next one here. There are the choices. Give me about 30 seconds again to answer that one. Very good. Well, the majority have got that one right. Um, this was a very interesting case um, here of a uh, pseudo aneurysm um, that um, uh, was really. Um, I'll go. I think it's on the next slide here. Yes, there's the right answer. Very good, everyone. Our 656 percent of you. Uh, you can see that the contrast first appeared here and appeared to delineate the apex right here, but. Uh, then uh, this was like a, a slow bolus, so there's kind of progressive opacification, and then the, you can see there's another little hole right here. Um, I apologize that this uh, it may be not playing quite at the frame rate that's helpful for that, but you can see there's a little hole here, and then contrast filling another cavity here uh, outside of what we thought was previously the apex here, which is really a scar here, which, as you can see, doesn't opacify at all, uh, but there's a little a narrow neck hole right here, uh, with contrast going into a uh, pseudoaneurysm, which it certainly complicates myocardial infarction, uh, as it did in this patient here. Uh, and contrast is very helpful for delineating both the neck, uh, the narrow neck, uh, and the systolic flow into the pseudoaneurysm. Here's another example uh, of a patient that we just had uh, recently where uh, they had a distal, uh, a pulmonic valve prosthesis 
And, uh, and traditionally, you think, well, we can see the pulmonic valve pretty easily, uh, but this was a valved conduit. It wasn't just a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a pulmonic valve prosthesis. Uh, and uh, that patient, this patient had a right ventricular systolic pressure of 70. Um, and uh, this is all we were getting for the gradient across the, uh, uh, the uh, valved conduit. Uh, but again, we were concerned because of a poor window quality that maybe we weren't getting good Doppler quality. So we just gave a slow infusion of a contrast agent, and look at this. Um, you can see there was a big gradient across that uh, valve conduit uh, that was not delineated with uh, just simple Doppler examination. That actually turned out to be a, this is a CT image from that patient that was obtained after the uh, a Doppler echocardiogram demonstrating that there was a stenosis. Right here's the pulmonary artery bifurcation here, uh, and just at the distal part of that uh, valve conduit, there was a discrete stenosis. And for these um, uh, uh, Doppler, uh, or these abnormalities that are in the far field, like this was, uh, uh, and like aortic stenosis is sometimes, uh, contrast enhancement can be very helpful uh, for improving the Doppler signal quality. Now, we want to spend just a couple minutes, like the document did, on... Um, the uh, safety aspects, you remember in 2007, the, uh, con uh, the FDA uh, listed um, a black box warning on the uh, use of contrast agents uh, in several uh, areas that uh, were quite perplexing to everyone, uh, such as patients with critical, in the critical care unit or with pulmonary hypertension, um, uh, and uh, there uh, was concern that um, this would uh, obviously hamper the use of contrast and, and potentially the beneficial effects of contrast. Well, um, as you know, since that black box warning, uh, several multi-center and single-center studies have shown uh, that uh, for both Definity and Optison, as well as for Sonaview in Europe, a uh, very uh, safe profile, uh, and uh, there's been a series of of uh, revisions uh, that the FDA has made uh, since then, uh, uh, with respect, most recently with respect to um, uh, stress echocardiography and pulmonary hypertension, uh, and, uh, and there's no longer any kind of period of monitoring required after uh, administration of contrast, um, and current contraindications are uh, listed as right-to-left uh, shunting, We'll go into that in just a little bit in a second. Hypersensitivity to uh, perflutrin, uh, or in the case of Optison, hypersensitivity to blood products. Um, it is the consensus of our writing group, though, uh, after reviewing all the literature that's been published uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands of cases now of patients receiving uh, contrast, that the life-threatening reactions that the FDA was originally concerned about are extremely rare, perhaps less than 1 in 10,000 uh, but that still requires that we should have um, resuscitation equipment available for what we call this anaphylactoid type of reaction that can occur. Uh, and uh, it is important that your lab be able to do that, as most echocardiography labs uh, are. Uh, and most importantly, it should not be used in as, as an excuse not to have a policy for contrast use in your hospital because of the overwhelming benefit of contrast use. Uh, and this uh, risk being extremely low. You certainly have to be prepared for it, but that risk is extremely low. Uh, in a setting of pulmonary hypertension, um, we did review this in the uh, 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 document uh, and reviewed several retrospective and prospective studies. So figure four uh, uh, is uh, given as a, and a, I'll give you an example of the, the largest study we could find looking at the right ventricular systolic pressures uh, ranging well above 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. You remember the case I just presented to you where we used it to enhance Doppler. Uh, patients' right ventricular pressures were 80. Uh, and the FDA has removed this as any contraindication to contrast use uh, because of data like this where over 6,000 patients were looked at uh, and a wide spectrum of different uh, elevations in right ventricular systolic pressure, including those exceeding 60 millimeters of mercury, where you can see those that got contrast versus those that did not con get contrast, both early uh, and late survival uh, were unaffected uh, by the use of contrast. So it is not a contraindication. Uh, there, uh, we don't have as much data yet, maybe, on, on formal data, I should say, on patent for or immunovalli, but we have large amounts of data. We know that a patent for immunovalli, which would technically qualify 
as a right to left shunt. Um, uh, we know that 35% of us are walking around with these, uh, and there have been no problems ever with all the patients receiving contrast, uh, and we assume 35% of them have patent for amyl valleys. So there clearly needs to be some uh, um, uh, uh, clarification of what, they, what is meant by right to left shunting. Uh, there's been a recent uh, paper uh, from uh, Chuck Herzog's group um, at Hennepin County uh, in JACC Cardiovascular Imaging that looked at just at patients that had documented right to left shunts with saline contrast, uh, and all of them did very well with um, uh, con uh, the systemic contrast administration. So uh, the writing group feels that um, it is certainly safe to use contrast uh, and that uh, uh, there is really uh, more work obviously needing to be done, but that uh, it's certainly safe in patients with patent for amyl volley. Uh, as well as patients with uh, even severe pulmonary hypertension. The Table 2 in the document, uh, again, gives you some key components for optimizing your exam. I encourage you to please spend some time looking at that. Um, again, as we said, very low MI uh, pulse sequence schemes like we described at the beginning of this talk uh, are considered optimal. Uh, remember, in that setting, you do maybe have to do a little near-field gain optimization. Um, uh, though some of the manufacturers now uh, are uh, already building that into their more current versions, like the X5, for example, uh, I, on the Philips, I know has some of that already built in. Um, but for the most part, uh, analyze your image um, uh, and make sure that you have homogeneous opacification. You may have to adjust the uh, time gain compensation in the near field slightly uh, and use the brief high mechanical index impulses if you can to clear the myocardium not the cavity of contrast, because uh, even if you don't want to look at uh, perfusion, uh, it is exquisitely helpful for analyzing wall thickening uh, during that replenishment phase. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, for example, during dobutamine or exercise stress echo, we find uh, that this is uh, very helpful. We get a brief time mechanical index impulse uh, and then analyze the wall thickening uh, as well as that rate of contrast or punishment uh, if you're interested in looking at perfusion, which is obviously off-label, uh, but still we think very helpful uh, as many uh, both multi-center studies have shown it correlates very closely with radionuclide uh, uh, you know, perfusion imaging uh, assessments of, uh, for coronary artery disease uh, and is very helpful in predicting the outcome of these patients uh, both during dobutamine and dipritamol, as well as a treadmill exercise stress echo and bicycle stress echo. So uh, to conclude, it is very important that um, the writing group felt that we work with uh, sites, um, uh, other organizations, um, the International Contrast Ultrasound Society, the Accreditation Committee, the American College and American Heart Association, uh, to uh, assist uh, sites in getting uniform use of contrast, uh, uh, at least uh, throughout the country, if not throughout the world, because uh, we, the benefits uh, uh, to the patient are, are currently just being in hospitals where contrast administration policies are in place. Um, and I think probably one of the most telltale um, uh, 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 examples of that uh, was Mike Main uh, in Kansas City, uh, publication at the beginning of this year uh, looking at hospitals that did use contrast within the first 48 hours uh, versus those that did not use contrast or patients that did not receive contrast uh, within the first 48 hours and looked at their uh, hospital mortality uh, in the first 48 hours. And using contrast in the first 48 hours uh, uh, with all kinds of propensity matching scales here, that's what these digits imply here, is trying to match patients as possible since these were retrospective comparisons. A lot of propensity matching was done to ensure we're looking at the same type of patients and same severity of disease. And you can see regardless of that, use of contrast in orange was associated with a significantly reduced mortality. There is a benefit, it appears, to getting that diagnosis right early, and contrast can help you as a sonographer and physician in getting there. Let's go to the final question here. Which of the following statements is true regarding ultrasound contrast agent use? A, ultrasound contrast agents should not be used in stage three to four chronic kidney disease. Ultrasound contrast agents are contraindicated in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. 
the anaphylactoid reactions to ultrasound contrast agents are rare, and B, ultrasound contrast agents should not be used in critically ill patients. I'll give you 30 seconds to answer that. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. A um, lot better than our first question, so hopefully getting the point across. But it's not surprising that you will hear this happen sometimes, that uh, because we use the word ultrasound contrast, uh, that someone will think they shouldn't get it because they have renal insufficiency or they've had an allergy to iodine. Um, and uh, the writing group took that into consideration, as I'll talk about in a moment, on, on how we should maybe rebrand this. But as we pointed out, ultrasound contrast agents are safe in chronic kidney disease, they're safe in severe pulmonary hypertension, and if anything, what we're seeing uh, from Mike Maines, the excellent uh, premier database analysis, is that uh, it is helping in critically ill patients uh, in terms of getting that diagnosis sooner. So anaphylactoid reactions, as we said, are rare. They're probably less than 1 in 10,000. Uh, but we should definitely have policies in place uh, to be ready for them. So because of that, um, the writing group felt it was very important that we consider a change in name. Uh, this is always hard to do um, because we're so used to using the word contrast, but really what we're talking about is taking an exam that is already very good uh, from the beginning of echocardiography, uh, from Harvey Feigenbaum's uh, very first images, we knew we had an excellent technique and something that we could take to the patient's bedside. We didn't have to give them any radiation, uh, and we could get exquisite quality images. But as we all know, um, uh, the image quality at times can be difficult, um, especially in our society with more obesity, more chronic lung disease, uh, more difficult settings we're made to walk to. Our sonographers are going out to the ICUs constantly, going to the emergency room. Everybody wants an echo. Uh, these days, um, we really need to make our study an optimal study if we're going to be able to take care of the patients like I showed you in the emergency room, get that diagnosis early, uh, make it right during the stress echo. We're really talking about ultrasound enhancement here. Uh, so we would like to call it an ultrasound enhancing agent uh, and um, uh, to distinguish it from iodine-based media or agents that people are concerned about with renal insufficiency. Uh, obviously, gadolinium is a concern in renal, ins renal insufficiency, uh, and um, uh, so, uh, the iodinated contrast agents are concerned, but we do not have that problem with um, ultrasound, uh, and what we're trying to do is keep the high quality uh, in our echocardiograms uh, as we um, uh, go into these more difficult situations. Perfusion may not be an approved indication, but we do know that these very low mechanical index real-time sequences that I talked to you about at the beginning of the talk should be used to improve left ventricular pacification. As I showed you that case where we picked up the apical thrombus uh, and where we picked up the pseudoaneurysm, those were with the very low real-time sequences. We weren't looking at perfusion. We were just trying to optimize left ventricular pacification, the FDA-approved indication. They do allow one to examine perfusion, and that's helpful information. But I think everyone should make a point of trying to learn to use these sequences just to improve regional wall motion analysis and quantitation of ejection fraction. And this really should be applied to all age groups. Um, we are seeing more and more pediatric cases uh, where the windows are difficult uh, and where they're being referred for either stress echocardiography or post-congenital uh, heart surgery evaluations of, of quantitative RV and LV function. Uh, this is a 13-year-old uh, that had uh, some difficult windows, uh, and we used it uh, because they had some uh, changes to chest pain with exertion. Uh, and sure enough, during the post-exercise image here, this is after that high mechanical index impulse where we're analyzing uh, the regional wall motion and, in this case, the perfusion. You can see in the four-chamber uh, and the three-chamber view, 
that although wall thickening and uh, the contrast enhancement in the myocardium looked okay at rest, there was a clear cut abnormality in perfusion uh, in the anterior septal and apical segments here uh, post exercise. Uh, and this patient had a uh, left anterior descending um, uh, fistula uh, that uh, was shunting blood away from this segment uh, during exercise uh, that was subsequently coil embolized uh, and the patient's symptoms uh, resolved. Uh, but again, you can see the uh, very exquisite delay and replenishment here in this anteroseptal and apical segment uh, in this 13-year-old that already had some difficult windows that had previous surgery, um, uh, and it made it difficult to see this uh, uh, without uh, contrast, but the perfusion defect was very striking. Other areas besides, outside of pediatric uh, imaging, vascular imaging, uh, carotid plaque uh, detection is improved with contrast, uh, and you get the added benefit of looking at plaque neovascularization. Uh, Vascular surgeons are using this for endograft evaluation uh, during ultrasound examinations. During transesophageal echo, if you look at movie 10 in the document, uh, you can see that um, difficult to analyze left atrial appendage cases where there's a lot of spontaneous contrast, and you're not sure is that a thrombus or spontaneous contrast. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the very low uh, mechanical index pulse sequence schemes on the transesophageal echo uh, instrumentation, but uh, we uh, really think it will help, but even if you use a very low mechanical index uh, scheme here, you can see um, uh, Dr. Moldes uh, has a very nice example in there demonstrating uh, left uh, atrial appendage uh, uh, clearly uh, delineated with contrast and helped ru rule out a possible uh, appendage thrombus. Three-dimensional echo, uh, there's been some studies already uh, using contrast for optimal quantification of ejection fraction and regional wall motion. Unfortunately, again here, um, uh, the, the, the use of the very low mechanical index pulsing sequence schemes it has not been put on the three-dimensional imaging software yet, uh, and so we're stuck with using a, a very low mechanical index, if we can, a harmonic image, uh, to try to get these uh, improvements in ejection fraction and regional wall motion. Uh, there clearly needs to be uh, more help from industry in this area to get uh, the optimal pulse sequence schemes uh, for the 3D acquisitions. I want to close there and thank you for paying attention so uh, well. If you have any further questions, we're going to take some now. But remember, you can always go to contrastzone.com uh, on the American Society of Echo website um, where uh, we provide a lot of this information in addition to going to the document uh, as you develop your lab uh, and hopefully optimize contrast uh, for day-to-day -day use. Thank you. I'm going to start with uh, question one. Is anyone uh, performing myocardial contrast um, from Joseph? Let's start with uh, question one. Coming in later. Yes, we are performing uh, uh, myocardial contrast echo on a daily basis uh, because we feel that the perfusion information uh, is adds uh, additional value uh, during a study in terms of prognosis and detection of coronary artery disease. In answer to question five, do you need standing orders uh, from uh, physicians or can you just have them a part uh, of your protocol? Yes, I think that in our laboratory, uh, we have standing orders uh, from physicians. Uh, I think if you have a hospital administration policy, that should work as well. Number six was use of contrast to rule out dissection of the ascending aorta. Uh, I think that that's a very interesting application, and I've seen some examples of that that are very vivid. And if you do need that, uh, both during transesophageal echo, um, uh, to rule out an artifact, um, that would be helpful. Most of the time it's very evident, though. Uh, but if you have a question about an artifact, that would be helpful. Number eight is, does the scope of practice for echo tech allow and support contrast injection by the tech? I think that varies from hospital to hospital, Margie. I would say that um, in uh, most uh, cases, uh, I think uh, there is a need for that because uh, uh, we are seeing that we need contrast in at least 30 to 35 percent of our regular echoes, uh, and those are often during busy times of the day. 
so it, it depends on the size of your practice, but I think um, in busy hospitals or hospitals where there's a lot of uh, echoes being performed, as we're seeing more and more of uh, these as echo becomes more utilized in patient care, that uh, it does support uh, its use uh, within uh, the scope of practice. Question 11 is, are your echo text injecting Optison or Definity? If so, where do you find the supporting documents to allow this practice? There is, uh, in our hospital right now, we're just working on getting our echo text, um, uh, giving these uh, two different agents the... Um, and we use either. Uh, it it uh, both have been effective uh, in improving left ventricular opacification using the techniques we described. But I would say that um, the uh, you know other hospitals are probably uh, using it even uh, echo text more frequently than we are uh, right now. Thirteen. When Definity was first being used, we were encouraged to recheck tricuspid regurgitation velocities with Definity to better determine if a patient has pulmonary hypertension. We had a couple of examples where each time the tricuspid regurgitation was checked, the velocity seemed to gradually increase. Has anyone else experienced this phenomenon? Uh, this is a good question because I think you really want to make sure you turn your gain down uh, when giving contrast because you'll get a very large amount of noise uh, into the image if you don't do that. Uh, we typically go below 10% on the contrast gain, uh, and then I think you avoid some of the blooming that you may see, uh, and you'll just see the very crisp signal uh, of the regurgitant jet or stenosis jet. Number 14, do we need to obtain consent forms for all patients before administration if in an outpatient setting? We do not obtain contra uh, uh, consent for uh, contrast at all. It's an FDA-approved drug. You don't give a uh, consent form for any other FDA-approved drug I presume you're giving. Uh, and even if it's an off-label indication, uh, we will use uh, certain drugs. So whether inpatient or outpatient, uh, I don't think a consent form uh, is necessary. I think you just inform the patient uh, of, the, of what you're doing. Um, I, do I understand that echo contrast could be contraindicated for the detection of an atrial septal defect with right to left shunting? I would say right now, yes, that probably fits into the uh, setting of a contraindication. Number 16, do you have any recommendations for lowering mechanical index? I know that lowering the power will also lower the MI, but are there any other settings that can be changed? I think when you lower the mechanical index, you may need to turn your time gain compensations up a little bit um, or your overall gain up a little bit uh, to get, uh, you know, which is in, in order to uh, produce that uh, homogeneous opacification of the left ventricle. And uh, that varies from patient to patient. When you're using the low mechanical index setting, the um, settings probably should be less than 0.3, uh, but in a very obese patient, you may need to use a little bit more. Uh, in a patient that's thin, you may use, use a little bit less, but you do have to turn the gain up a little bit to uh, still create some uh, uh, background tissue signal uh, in the left ventricle if you're using low mechanical index imaging. Number 17, contrast echo using agitated saline was originally used first in 1968, I believe, for detection of a right-to-left shunt. If a very small amount of pharmaceutical contrast is injected for this purpose, with much smaller bubbles than agitated contrast, why is anyone concerned about risk? That is a good question, um, and uh, I think there's always been a concern that since these are higher molecular weight, uh, longer-lasting microbubbles than the uh, saline bubbles, uh, that they may persist longer. But you're right, they're very small uh, and very safe, um, and I think, again, a lot of the contraindications arise just from uh, what uh, perceptions are, just like there was with pulmonary hypertension, uh, and hopefully we'll get some data on that to show that it is safe. But as of right now, uh, as the previous question was, it is still considered a um, contraindication with a large amount of right to left shunting, certainly not because of a patent foramenal volley. Is respiratory failure a, a contraindication for using contrast? Uh, no. Number 20, what is the status of Sonaview for left ventricular pacification in the United States? It is not iodine-based, uh, and we're hopeful that it will be approved soon. Number 22, is contrast considered safe to use if a patient is hypoxic? Again, hypoxic or pulmonary hypertension, 
are not uh, contraindications to uh, contrast use. Uh, number 23, do you recommend still using the less than 0.2 mechanical index in severely obese patients? Yes, we found that to be just as successful. Uh, you get just as much penetration uh, with that uh, very low mechanical index, uh, and even in these uh, obese patients. Now, I will say some very obese patients, we've gone maybe to 0.25, but we haven't had to go that much higher because the contrast still works quite well, um, uh, and uh, ultrasound penetrates fat pretty well. Uh, we've learned that. Uh, is the recommendation of mechanical index less than 0.2 recommended for all different types of ultrasound equipment? In general, yes. Now, I would say I haven't used uh, some of the ones on, for example, GE. I haven't used the pulse inversion modality on there. Uh, 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 it, but I think that less than 0.2 is a good uh, guideline at this point uh, because, again, you, if you go higher, you begin to create some tissue signals uh, that, uh, and you want a really good tissue cancellation technique. So you may want to go, if you want to try a little bit higher in a very obese patient, like the last question uh, what Christian has, it's certainly not like you, you're going to lose all that benefit. You'll just start to get a little tissue signal. Number 25, is there any contraindication to the use of contrast in patients on mechanical support, uh, such as le left ventricular assist device, impellas, uh, uh, and not only from a patient's safety perspective, but also with regard to the effect on the device itself? Uh, there's been some nice publications on this, especially in the left ventricular assist devices where um, uh, Mike Main has a nice example that we put in the contrast document showing the uh, pseudoaneurysm in a patient with, a, uh, on a, with an assist device, uh, and the Mayo Clinic group has published data uh, on uh, its uh, safety. Uh, we've used it hundreds of times uh, in left ventricular assist devices. Uh, and it seems to be very safe and certainly not associated with any device malfunction. Number 26, I'm a pediatric, uh, son pediatric sonographer, and we are wanting to know if contrast is safe for our adult congenital patients with complex congenital heart disease, mustard, stenning, Fontan. I believe it would be a great benefit due to the image quality of our adult congenital population. Thoughts? I agree totally, though it is not FDA approved yet in children, but most of these kids are now are often, quote-unquote, adults. So Shelby Cuddy, our pediatric cardiologist, has published uh, uh, data on this in just the patients you described here, Ruby, uh, and has shown that it does provide some very nice perfusion and right and left ventricular wall motion data that uh, was not possible, and Doppler data that was not possible in these patients uh, without contrast. So uh, that was in European Heart Journal a couple of years ago, I refer you to that article, uh, and I would get started using it. Is severe liver disease a contraindication to any of the available contrast agents? No. And number 28, are there any neurologic effects that can possibly happen due to enhancement uh, of bubbles? No. Uh, for private practice, is a signed consent form necessary for the use of contrast? No. No longer consent forms are needed? Correct. Uh, number 33, do you think that contrast agents can overestimate the pulmonary hypertension? Uh, as we talked about previously, you want to turn that gain down uh, uh, to less than 10% to avoid some of that blooming artifact and just get that, that very nice crisp uh, signal uh, you're looking for. And when we have done that, we have found no overestimation of any Doppler signal. Is there reimbursement codes for using contrast? Yes, there is. This has been a limitation for us uh, due to the cost of the contrast agent. Uh, go uh, to the ASC website, uh, and there should be some help there uh, on the contrast codes that are available for contrast uh, for ultrasound uh, enhancement use. We'll try to use our branding name there. Our hospital requires that patients receiving any new medication gets monitored for 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, there's, the FDA has removed that uh, requirement, and you do not need to do that for ultrasound contrast, but you do have to have safety uh, policies in place for that rare uh, anaphylactoid reaction. Please provide more information on the MI flash. I'd love to. Um, it basically is a very uh, good technique. Talk to your local representatives. If you have the very low MI software, pretty much all the manufacturers also have with that something they call flash or a high MI um, impulse that um, uh, the, um, will allow you to clear the contrast. The, the, your, even your local um, uh, uh, assistants or reps should know uh, how to use that if you have that software. It's, a, it's just enough to clear the myocardium 
and not the cavity because um, as Kevin Away and the group at Oregon has very nicely shown that flow in capillaries is very low and that's what you're looking at when you see the myocardial contrast. That it gets cleared with that high mechanical index impulse, which is just four or five frames uh, at an MI that's still well within FDA approval, somewhere between 1 to 1.3 uh, mechanical index. And that clears that myocardial contrast, uh, and then you can analyze that replenishment uh, and also get that very good regional wall motion analysis. Uh, uh, go to the uh, ASC contrast on website. If you can't get the information you need there, please send me an email, uh, and we'll, we'll try to help you use that because I find that extremely helpful uh, in a clinical setting. It appears that we've kind of run over a little bit here. I love all these questions, though, so, uh, and we'll try to get to them via email. Thank you very much.